Welcome to today's podcast. I've got an amazing guest for you today. He's one of the most recognized personal power and mindset coaches in Germany. He has a huge following on social media and he's currently bringing his skills to the European market. You may, what you probably know Ben for is his motivational videos on his podcast, I Am Possible. One of his poems entitled I Am Possible on YouTube has had millions and millions of views. Use. And if you tune in right to the end of this podcast, Ben is going to give a personal rendition of that poem. So with his poetry, music and creative videos, as well as his humour, Ben manages to break up the old-fashioned and monotonous formats of personal development and he takes them to a new level. I hope you enjoy this podcast as much as I enjoyed recording it. Thanks for tuning in. You're listening to The Simply Flawsome Show, a podcast designed for you to listen, learn, and leverage. Please welcome your host, Zoe Turner. So, wow, have I got a very special guest for you today. Today's guest, he's a multi-talented motivational coach and fitness enthusiast. He's also a filmmaker, entrepreneur, poet, rapper, and motivational speaker. His fantastic poem, I Am Possible, is a summary of his movement to inspire people from all walks of life to believe in their dreams, but most of all, to believe in themselves and take action in spite of fear and resistance. His focus is mental and emotional fitness. So I'm very excited to speak to him today because the ongoing theme of the Simply Flawsome podcast is mental health. So I'm really interested to find out a few of your life hacks, Ben. So welcome to the podcast today. And it is Ben Watara. Watara. I did practice this with Carl (laughs) before. So Ben Watara. So welcome, Ben. Thank you so much, Zoe, for having me on the podcast. And I feel honored to be here today. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited for this podcast. Excellent. So Ben, by way of introduction, um, I started this podcast um, because I'm writing a book at the moment um, entitled, the working title at the moment is Use It or Lose It, 30 Days to Mind Mastery. And I thought starting this podcast would be a wonderful opportunity, a great platform to talk about the issues that I raise in the book. So if you don't mind, today I'd like to pick five themes Mm -hmm. from the book so essentially it's about routine um, and I'd like to pick five different themes from the book to talk about today is that okay with you that's amazing okay so the themes I'd like to focus on are rock bottom Mm -hmm. gratitude okay exercise more specifically what happens to our body when we exercise Mm -hmm. overcoming fear and stepping outside your comfort zone okay peer groups and the power of repetition Okay, really nice topics. That's six and, uh, as well. And there's also something that uh, I wanted to just say to start off because I thought about this on my way here. Um, and you know, like we had a quick chat before we started the podcast. And the, the, the title of the podcast, Simply Flossom, right? And um, that's something that I think is, uh, is a message that, you know, like a lot of people can relate to. And um, it is this, you know, we, we're trying all to achieve something, you know, amazing. You know, want to be awesome or, you know, put something out there that inspires other people, whether it's a product, whether it's a service, whether it's a message, whatever it is. But the problem is that a lot of people are held back because they want it to be flawless. Right. And everything is in some regard flawed. If you really want to look at it, you're going to make mistakes when you go out there. Nothing is going to be perfect. Even to record this podcast, we were first in another room. Something went wrong. We had to come here. But at the end of the day, we had a better room than we had before. You know, so we can say that the plan was kind of flawed, you know, from the beginning and we had to adjust and, you know, go out there. And one of the most important things for a lot of people to realize is that you know, people need to get out of their comfort zone. That is something that you know, a lot of people have heard before. Mm-hmm. But what does that really mean, your comfort zone? You know? um, because the flaws, most times, people judge themselves and they're afraid of being judged by others. And that's why they don't want to expose their flaws, right? But most of the times, you're the one that's judging yourself. So you have an opinion of yourself. There are certain things about you that you don't like. 
That's why you don't want to expose them to the world. That's why most of the time you hold back on your greatness. You hide. You stay in your comfort zone or safety zone because there you're safe. No one can judge you. No one can find out what flaws you have. And at the same time, no one can find out how awesome you are, how awesome your message is. And that's why you're enslaving yourself. And, and I heard this quote last week. Um, I don't know who it is from, but he said, a body can be enslaved by others, but a mind can only be enslaved by yourself. And you're enslaving yourself and keeping yourself in that comfort zone because you're holding back. Mm. And that's why people cannot find out how awesome everything that you have to share is. Mm. And when you embrace your flaws mm. and you actually put yourself out there, first of all, you realize that most people don't care about these things. You're the only one that's holding yourself up to this, to this standard and that's judging himself. And some might, but it's just, you know, very small exceptions. And most of it is in your mind. That's why I love the, you know, the theme of the podcast in general. Thank you for that. So in one sentence or a paragraph, what does Flossom mean to you? Flossom means to me embracing your flaws or what you see as flaws and basically turning them into strength, you know. But a lot of times it has to do with self-love because you don't accept certain things about yourself. And that's why you judge yourself and you're afraid to be judged. But when you put yourself out there, you'll realize that a lot more people are actually awesome and accepting. And when you dare to um, be vulnerable, mm. which is what happens when you get outside of your comfort zone, you realize that these flaws or showing these flaws, which a lot of times people feel that vulnerability is weakness, mm. but it's actually the biggest strength. Yeah. And that's also the way where you're going to be able to empower other people as well. Yeah. Because you're afraid to be judged, but a lot of times people will connect to you even more. People are afraid of rejection. Mm. You think that if people find out this about me or people see me in this light and I'm not perfect, I'm not going to be accepted. I'm going to be rejected. But most of the times when you do that is when you actually connect to people. Yeah. But you isolate yourself. And that's why I think Simply Flossom is a motto that, you know, everyone should live by in any, you know, like in any area of life, yeah. whether it's love, whether it's business, whether it's, you know, friendships, mm. everything. Thank you for like that. I like your take on that. And, you know, you got me thinking because it's also just about being yourself. And like you say, when we're being ourselves, um, you know, it's about showing vulnerability, mm. you know, because nobody is perfect. And the more you are vulnerable, the more you connect. Mm. to kind of people and to your audience as well so okay so we'll mm. go more into the themes later yeah. Ben but first <laughs> of all um, take us back like where did this journey start for you where are you from when did you start when did you decide that you wanted to help and to serve others okay so um, I grew up in the Ivory Coast uh, my dad is uh, Ivorian, my mom is German, so um, yeah, I grew up there, first language that uh, you know, I was speaking was French and German, was raised bilingual, and um, most of the things that I teach right now I, are, are like, um, techniques or like tools that I needed for myself, because when I grew up I was very introverted, I was very shy, I didn't dare to look people in the eye, I was always hiding, I didn't want to be in the mm. middle, like in school, I never you know, wanted to raise my hand even if I knew the answer, because even if there was one percent chance that I was wrong or I just didn't want to be in a spotlight I didn't want other people to judge me and exactly that I had so many judgments on myself I wasn't aware of it at the time but um, and I was actually a very good student and I was very good but I realized that a lot of um, you know the fear that I had drove me to become very good in certain areas yeah right? because that's the thing you want you don't want to be weak because you're so afraid of judgment that you start to become good at everything, which yeah. can, you know, like create a certain level of success, but then it's driven by fear. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many people compliment you and how many, um, how much success you have, as long as you keep judging yourself, you're never free of it, right? But th that was like in my childhood, then um, we left the Ivory Coast when I was 12. You know, my dad is an entrepreneur, started his own business, so we moved. For me as a child, it meant I'm, you know, leaving behind my friends, the school. I'm coming into to Belgium, a completely different system, school system, you know, different people. Now I'm the only dark-skinned kid in the class, you know, which now it's impossible to hide, you know. So I'm like, everyone's like, where are you from? What's this? What's that? And it was so uncomfortable for me. And, and, and then I tried to fit in, right, because I didn't want to be excluded. 
So I had to figure out, okay, how do the rules work here? How, do, how can I adjust? How can I adapt? Things that were cool here are no longer cool here. Things that were funny here are not funny here. So basically like learning a new language, the environment. Now you adjust to the environment. Then two years later, we moved to Germany. So again, new school, new environment, new language. Now on top of it, you have the barrier of, and, and, and that's so interesting because when we talked about the flaws that you have or the weaknesses that you have, a lot of times these are the, you know, like, the challenges that make you awesome. Because to overcome that, you actually have to become better. Like my English, for example, I you know was very bad when I came to Germany. I couldn't speak it. My German, I couldn't read and write. You know, so now I had to work much more than everyone else. How old were you when you moved to Germany? 14. So I was 14. Um, came to Germany, and then um, I basically had to catch up with so many things. And back then, I didn't see it. But I mean, now I speak five languages. I'm able to adjust and adapt to different cultures, to different environments. I can understand other people, be empathetic because. I try to fit in everywhere like a chameleon, you know, it costs a lot of energy. Like a chameleon, you put him on green, it becomes green. You put him on red, it becomes red. He's able to adjust, but on one hand, it costs a lot of energy. Second, you're like, who am I? Because now I'm trying to adjust to everyone, but who am I actually, you know? So then it comes to this issue, what you just said, being yourself is sometimes like, what is being myself? Who am I? Mm. And then on top of it, this all, am I black? Am I white? Am I this? Am I that? You know, so it's just like you identify. Mm. So is your dad's black and your mom's white? Exactly. Yeah. So, so that, that was the thing also, like when I came to Europe, everyone thinks I'm black because to them I'm black, you know, because of my complexion. But mm. when I'm in, in the Ivory Coast, for some people I'm white. And then, yeah, you know, just yeah. so the whole thing, it, it just like made me um, question so much. And, you know, like from a very young age, try to figure out, you know, like who, who I am, where do I fit in? What do I want? And on top of it, I'm introverted, but I'm being put in situations where now I have to step outside of my comfort zone mm. more and more whether I want it or not. And fast forward, you know, like a couple of years, I mean, like I transformed my being introverted to being cool, you know? Mm -hmm. So now I was like, um, you know, I was with a group of friends and I was kind of cool. I started, you know, working out because I mean, like I wanted to be stronger. I wanted, you know, cause I always felt like threatened by everything. So basically fear made me, you know, like strong and good in many different areas, but I still had this big insecurities inside of myself. And um, I really realized that, um, well, I, I studied, you know, in, a, in an art academy and, and, and I started to step by step, you know, like really let go a little bit, but I was still like cool. I was the person's like, before I didn't talk to you because I was afraid of rejection. Now I'm not talking to you because I, I'm too cool to talk to you, you know, <laughs> but basically there was the same energy behind it. I was always afraid of rejection. So I would only do the things where I was sure not to be rejected and also to talk about it. Then again, you know, as a man, you don't, you know, you, you're not taught to show vulnerability. It's, it's, it's seen as a weakness, right? So you're not going to say I'm afraid of rejection. You know what I mean? So you actually, even for yourself, you're not opening up to other people, but also you don't even allow yourself to even go there with your thoughts because you even think of, you, you judge yourself, ah, let's not be so weak, you know, be a man, you know, all these kind of things. So that's why it took me a long time and um, I never forget it when there was a turning point. I was, I don't, I don't know exactly the age, but I think like when I was 21, you know, like I was a student that studied in an art academy and um, I had a cousin, uh, an uncle of mine that I met, that I've never met him before, you know, because he lived in the States and, you know, I met him for the first time. And he was just so confident, you know, mm -hmm. and, and he was like asking me straight up questions. You know, he was he was with my dad and I just saw him one evening and he was like, yeah, so what are you doing? You know, and everything. And uh, and, and he could look right through me. He asked me a couple of questions and he told me, you know what? I think that you are a communicator because all the things that you do, like I did filmmaking, I did music, mm -hmm. poetry, the mm -hmm. way I express myself says you are a communicator. Your nature is to be a communicator, but you have a lot of fears. You have a lot of limitations. And basically he spoke. And I was just like, how does he know that? He doesn't even know me. You know, it's the mm. first time I'm meeting him, like after 30 minutes, how basically it was almost like coaching me, mm. asking me certain questions through the responses. Sounds like he was probably one of your first mentors. He was my first mentor, you know, like, mm. and, and so I asked him straight up, I, I said, how, how, how are you doing this? You know, how do you know what you know? Because that was the first time that I really got confronted. Because with he it. went through it. Exactly. And he knew the sources. Because mm. that was, man, I don't even know what year that was. 1996 or something like uh, 2000. I don't know the, exactly the year, but I was 21 and there was no, you know, like YouTube and all these, you know, podcasts and YouTube channels and all that, you know, content out there. Like now it's more popular, but back then you didn't have that. 
So he gave me a list of books and he said, you know, read this. You know, there was like Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy, Tony Robbins and like all these things. And that was the first time that I was confronted with that. And then I just started to study it. You know, I really went inside it and, you know, NLP and then you just re really you can reprogram yourself and understand where all these things are coming from, these thoughts, these emotions, you know, everything that you're going through. And then I was just like, wow, you know, and... So and you shared a little bit about your childhood. Where were a lot of these limitations coming from? Because your dad was an entrepreneur. You grew up, so I'm assuming that you grew up in quite a progressive, forward thinking. I'm assuming this. Yeah. I mean, I might be wrong. Um, purely by the fact that, you know, entrepreneurs have a certain mindset. Yeah. Um, you know, so from what you, you explained to me, there was issues with your identity as you were growing older. And I know you've just shared that some of that was, am I white, am I black? Yeah. Um, but, you know, where did a lot of these limitations come from, would you say? To be honest, I don't really know where exactly they came from. I'm sure they came from the environment, some assumptions that I created myself. Because, I mean, that's something that I do. I work with a lot of people to, you know, really release their limiting beliefs. And a lot of people think that they have to go into their childhood and really understand what was the issue, what was... But at the end of the day, it's just important to identify what's there. Is it really true? And then work with that and release it, you know, based on the information that you have now. Mm. Because there's so many things that are said in the environment. We pick up everything. Like, no one remembers how they learned their first language mm. because they just picked it up from the environment. But with that, you pick up habits, you pick up behaviors, patterns, your beliefs about money, about yourself, about, you know, maybe, you know, you try to do something and your mom said, like, don't show off, you know, like, be more humble, you know, don't be, you know, whatever it is, you don't remember exactly where it came from. Maybe my younger sister was born. I have a, you know, two year old younger sister, maybe all the attention came on her. And then I, I don't know what it is because there's certain beliefs you create on your own. You, you see a situation and now you interpret it with your knowledge from back then. And the problem is that subconscious beliefs, they're so strong because they just come up as emotions. We don't really know what the thoughts are behind them. And then we don't question them. And that's why it's just like, I was able to, and you know, there, there's, there are many systems that you can use to really release that without necessarily needing to go back into the past and really understand it. So I don't know exactly what it was because, I mean, my sister grew up around the same environment and she didn't have the same limitations. She had other limitations. So it's very individual on how we see reality, how we interpret it. Even identical twins that grew up in the same environment can have completely different mindsets around the same topics, right? Because yeah. it's all how we filter it through our minds. Now it's important to go in and ask ourselves, is it really true? And in what areas is this limiting me? Because they're all lies that we're telling ourselves in our own mind. And now we're using the environment, what someone said, as proof to justify that belief. It's just like a tabletop and now you have the legs and now mm. you're just like, oh, but this person said that and this happened to me and no, but I got rejected when I did this one time. So now you're kind of reinforcing that mm. belief. So you got onto the road of per professional de personal development. Yeah. Um, your uncle introduced you to all these books and you kind of relished them. Yeah. Um, when did you start forming your own identity and when did you start feeling more comfortable with in your skin and who you are? It's really a process. I mean, like it started really when I was like 16 because it's I, I, I believe that a lot of times people think that it's this one turning point it's not you know like it's just we keep on building that's why I really don't like the word the term grown up you know people say I'm grown up it means like you're done growing you keep on growing as long as you put yourself in different situations right so now you put yourself in this situation for example I got more confident you know I started to you know work out I started to master my body so obviously in certain environments you're more comfortable you're more mm -hmm. confident because you know you're strong you know you're good at something once you're master for example a skill or in business you know a lot of people they're very confident when it comes to their business environment but then they're you know like they, they can't you know go and talk to a woman or in, in other environments they're very shy they're very timid so the environment plays also a very big impact on it right mm -hmm. so it's just been step by step where I just realized that in certain areas I was confident you know like I started doing music I was even you know doing concerts but then when it comes to oh you have an idea and you can put it out and you you know now it's like oh Oh, you know, I, I studied um, videography, you know, in the art academy. Now going out, for example, as an entrepreneur and, you know, offering your services and asking for money and asking for more money, for example. And then it's like self-worth, like all these things. So it was all a gradual process. 
And I used and started to implement the techniques that I was learning in personal development and apply them immediately. Because that's the thing I see that a lot of people, um, and, and that might be a problem of our time now, because there's so much out there, people are just consuming and over consuming. Mm. You know, and then back then I didn't have that much, you know. So what I found, you know, I started, you know, working with some, you know, audio programs from Tony Robbins, for example, or Brian Tracy. And I would just take like two sources and then dive in and then apply it, you know, and I would go out, you know, so I had a friend of mine and we started to, uh, it was like, you know, door to door kind of a, as a product that we were selling. And, and I heard Brian Tracy that he said, um, you know, if there's one thing that I would teach my son is sales, especially door to door, because you learn how to, you know, handle rejections. I heard that, I went out and I did it, you know, because that's yeah. the thing, you can intellectually say, oh, that makes sense, you never do it, and you feel that you understand it, but you don't know anything unless you do something. So that's the thing that you can't just, release beliefs by switching it in your mind and feeling like oh i think i got it no now go and confront that one thing that you're afraid now you really figure it out and you feel that resistance so that means you got to work a little bit more on that maybe there's some knowledge you need maybe you need to the, the, um, put yourself in an environment of people that are actually doing it because you have so many beliefs you know we think that just because someone is out there and they're good at what they do they must be a natural i'm not a natural do you really know that how many people did you talk to how many rejections do they get even though they've been doing it for 10 years so there's so many things that you kind of learn along the way with the information so that's what i've done and um i started many different businesses with friends of mine and you know ways to make money and to figure out you know what am i really good at what can mm. i really do and then I came to Dubai like seven years ago and started the production company here because mm -hmm. video, videography and filmmaking is what you know, like I was doing at the time. That was the best that I knew how to help people and serve and bring value uh, as a director. And um, that's what I did. So yeah, fast forwarding uh, you know, a lot. Okay, thanks for that. <laughs> um, ben, let's start talking about uh, the themes that I'm sure we've, we've covered some of them already, but the themes that um, I spoke about at the beginning. Um, I'd like to talk first about rock bottom, mm -hmm. okay? Um, one of my favorite quotes is that if you want to see the sunshine, you have to weather the storm. And I truly believe that there's nothing more humbling than actually reaching rock bottom. And you don't actually appreciate that until you've actually been there. And I truly also believe that we need to have a struggle in our lives that we can learn from. Do you have any specific rock bottom moments that you would care to share with us today? And if so, what did you learn during that process? Mm. And how did you get yourself out of that situation? I had many situations that felt like rock bottom. Now I'm gonna um, explain on that because I really believe that it is just in our minds a feeling that we are at rock bottom. And while we are in the moment, it doesn't feel like that. It feels like it's rock bottom. Mm. In retrospect, you're like, oh, that was just a moment in time. Exactly. And so, yeah. and, and that's why I believe it's so important because we hear a lot, and I see, you know, maybe entrepreneurs or people that want to be successful, they heard stories from people they look up to. Oh, yeah, this person failed so many times and they got stronger, and they hear all that. And they're like, yeah, that's true. And I know I have to go through that, but at the same time, they're not starting because they're afraid of that, mm. right? And um, so one very specific moment was, I mean, I came to Dubai, um, started up you know, a company in Abu Dhabi with a business partner, didn't turn out the way I wanted. And basically I left everything behind, came here. And um, I, because we were in Abu Dhabi all the time, I didn't really spend that much time in Dubai. That was like the first year, so I didn't know that many people. And um, basically, it didn't work out the way I, I expected. Many things went wrong, and I ended up with like, I don't know, like 2,000 dirhams in my pocket out of the company and by myself. And I was really, really thinking, okay, I'm just gonna go back to Germany, you know? And uh, that's something that I think a lot of people in Dubai can relate to. Uh, there's no place like Dubai for people that wanna start something from scratch, you know, because you come here, you don't have no family, you don't know anyone, you left everything behind, and a lot of times it doesn't work out, you know, the way you planned. Um, but, you know, so, so basically you're jumping and learning how to fly on the way down. And, and, and I was there and I was just literally, like for two, three weeks, feeling sorry for myself, um, feeling like I've lost everything, I don't have anything, and, and, and that was basically um, a point where I switched yeah. because 
um, I was sitting there watching Netflix. I remember it was uh, Spartacus, I think. I was watching the series and just, just, just to not think, you know, just numb your mind and ordering pizza and, mm. you know, just sitting there feeling sorry for myself and why did I do this, why this, blaming other people, like, like that. Acting like the victim. Exactly. I love the time frame that you're, sorry for interrupting, but mm. I love the time frame that you put on that, like two to three weeks. Yeah. Because whenever I've had those moments, it's normally about two weeks, one mm. to two weeks. And then I just think, Zoe, get a grip. Yeah. Get a grip. You know, how long can you like play the victim? You know, and I'm not kind of like um, minimizing anyone's like, you know, what you went through or what yeah. other people go through. But we have to move on and stop playing the victim. And the more we stay in that victim mentality, and we start blaming everyone else for the situation we're in rather than take control and, you know, kind of come from the the solution focused mindset what can you do to change this situation but yeah it's normally for me I will wallow in self pity for about probably about two weeks max yeah and it sounds like you're the same yeah I mean um, that was that moment um, because you see the thing is when you blame other people you don't take responsibility mm. and responsibility is like your ability to respond right so now you're not responding to the situation you're trying to put give other people the power basically because it's his fault if this happened or if that will change maybe luck you know something will happen and then you know everything is going to get better so because i've had all the theory and that is very important because i was going through and i studied all the content and everything about mindset and everything about you know emotions and thoughts and it's like your emotions are created by the questions you ask yourself in your own mind if you ask better questions then you get better you know answers so I was just like, okay, what are the questions that I'm asking myself? What are the thoughts that I have in my mind? To just actually just be aware of it. Because that's the thing, you're not aware, you're unconscious. So I ask myself, okay, one second, what's good about this? Because you never ask yourself, what's good about this situation right now? Like earlier, we went to another room and then we had to move, but now we got a better room, right? So actually it was good in retrospect. So I'm asking myself, okay, what's good about this? And I start to ask myself, okay, what's good about this? I'm here in Dubai. When I came one year ago, I didn't know anyone. I didn't know how anything worked. There's um, so many opportunities that I have right now that I'm not even chasing. Like, what do I have? Because I was like, I have nothing, right? Because I, do, I don't have no money right now. But it's like, well, what do I have? And I started to look at it as that, okay, you know, like I have skills. I speak five languages. I'm charismatic. I can go out and talk to people. I have like, and, and I started to really write down everything that I have. And instead of looking at what you lost, looking at what you can gain, instead of looking at what's bad, what's good, and just ask different questions. And you go in there and I started to write everything down. And then basically um, you feel it in your body because all you do is projecting. Mm. When you have hope, people sometimes say, yeah, I don't visualize, like I don't do this visualization thing. But what they do is, they visualize all the negative because they see, why don't you try this? Ah, it's not going to work. How do you know? Because you're visualizing it not working. You're just not doing positive visualization. You're not looking at what could work. So then you just go in and you start to project yourself. And immediately you feel it in your body. I know everything about physiology. I didn't work out for like two or three weeks. So I, I just stood up, went outside, threw away all the food that you know, like I, just, I just had ordered and you know, like put in a fridge. I just went to the beach and I started running, doing push-ups, visualizing. And it just basically everything that I was doing before. Because that's the thing sometimes. You have routines. You have structures. You have things that you start to do when you need them. But a lot of times you got to do them even when you don't feel like it because that's what actually is going to create that energy within you. You don't even come into that hole. And, you know, I just went out and I, I started. Obviously, it's a process. You know, it didn't change overnight. I went out. Even if you do the right things, like if you go to the gym for two weeks, you look in the mirror and you look like, okay, not, nothing much changed. Doesn't mean that nothing happened. You just got to keep doing it. So I just went out, started to meet people. And I actually, you know, like I was in... Um, 76th floor in the building, uh, Marina 23. And I was staying at a friend's place because I didn't have no money. I was staying, you know, at you know, friend's places, sleeping on a couch. And, and I just looked out of the balcony and I just saw the, you know, the city, the you know, Sheikh Zayed Road. And I see so many people, cars, people walking down, buildings, lights. And I'm just like, there's so many opportunities out there, but I have no access to them because I'm in here for two weeks. And I always say, you're only as free as the options that you know, not as the options that you have. Maybe you have 100 options right now, but you only know one. You only have one option. 
So all you got to do is go out there and create more connection with the possible options that are out there. And that's all in the mind. And other people can do that for you by asking you the right questions. But if you have the ability to pull yourself out of that, then what I did there for two, three weeks could have happened in two days or mm. two hours. Mm. You know, some people can stay there for a year. Yeah. They say Dubai is an amazing city for creating those connections. But I truly believe wherever you are, wherever you are in the world, as long as you've got the desire to do that, you can go out there and you can create yeah, a definitely. good network and good connections. Thank you for that. I'd like to talk a little bit more now about gratitude. Mm. Now, um, neuroscientists believe that gratitude is the key to positivity mm. and expressing gratitude on a morning, it can affect our brain on a psychological level. Yeah. In fact, that they actually say gratitude is a very good antidepressant. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested to know, do you practice gratitude in your life? Yeah. If so, do you have any kind of a little routine that you care to share with us? I mean, um, First of all, what you just said is 100% true. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people are um, always looking at trying to combat um, a symptom instead of asking themselves what created that symptom in the first place. Mm -hmm. right? When we say antidepressant, it's like there is already chemicals in your body that are creating depression. What, For example, stress hormones, right? Mm -hmm. for example, cortisol. And mm -hmm. it's just like, how was it created? By worrying, for example, you yeah. know? and that's what most people do. They wake up in the morning, they think about everything they got to do, they're reacting, responsive, they're always in lack, oh, maybe I can't pay the bills, I got to do this, I got to do that, projecting, visualizing. They're visualizing everything that can go wrong, and the problem is a mind doesn't know the difference between something that's happening and something that we're imagining. That's why it's responding. Right? If, you, if you think right now, oh, you have a presentation maybe in three weeks and you're super introverted and you know, like, you're afraid of being on stage in front of a thousand people and you think about it right now, your heart can start to beat, you can start to sweat and you start to shake. Why? Because your body thinks that it's happening right now because you imagine it in your brain. And the longer you stay in that stressed state, the longer you're actually creating these hormones that are now changing and sickening your body. Now we think we need positive visualization to combat that. But why do we even create that? And that's the thing, it's like, there's a difference between us and animals, right? It's the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So when we are in fight or flight mode, for example, animals, they see a lion come, it just activates that fight or flight mode, mm. they run, and what the next thing is what they do? They can just eat. Because they're relaxed. Danger is gone. No more worry. They're not thinking, maybe the line is still there. Maybe it's going to come tomorrow. Maybe it's going to come in one hour. Maybe this, maybe that. They don't hear that. So they don't think that. So we humans, we have the ability to actually create that fear at any moment, at any time. And we are in that stressed state. But when you're in that stressed state, you can't really relax. You can't sleep. You can't digest well. And there's so many diseases that can be created from that. So that's why that's the first thing to just ask yourself, what are you doing that's actually making you sick, that's actually making you stressed and removing that? And that alone is going to neutralize it. Because if we have the ability to create the fear, then we also have the ability to neutralize the fear and to create a positive outcome. And, and that's the thing, it's like, it's not, it's not a default that you're in fear and you have to remove the fear. You are the one creating it at any moment, right? And that's the thing, it's visualization. You are visualizing the worst outcome. And that's the thing with, with gratitude. I extend, I expand gratitude. So every single morning, I, I have that every single day because it's just, it's a matter of focus. When you're in lack, you're focusing on everything you don't have. And because you don't have enough money, because you don't have enough recognition, because you don't have enough respect, because you don't have enough this, now you're actually acting from lack. You're acting from fear. And that's most of the time what's going to keep you in the comfort zone because you're so stressed and you're so afraid to lose even more that you don't even dare to start. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, you have, a, you have a big project and you're like, oh, wow, you know, if, if, if I do that, it can change my life. But if I mess it up, then I lose everything. Nothing happened. But now you're already feeling that you can lose everything. And because of that, now you're stressed and now you might mess it up or not even start it, not even go after it, not even go talk to that person because you're already visualizing the loss. So that's why it's so important that when you wake up in the morning, you take control. 
I said, you either react or you create. So you create what you want to see in your life. You visualize your day. So I'm not only thankful and grateful for the things that I have, because we take so many things for granted. Like, I don't know, like five years ago, I, I pulled both my hamstrings when I was sprinting and I couldn't walk for like a week. It's a small injury, but then I realized, wow, walking is something that I was extremely grateful for after that week. But then we take so many things for granted. And that's why it's just like, I'm thankful for everything that I have, everything that I know, even the time that we live in. Like, I'm, there's so many, like, I don't have like something specific. Every single day I come up with like, the, you can do that endlessly. And then I actually project myself in the future. And I'm also thankful for everything that's coming as if it already did because I'm projecting myself into the future. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it really relaxes you. If you already have what you want, you're not afraid of losing it. That's why now you're not afraid of rejection. You, you know, you, you have enough. And mm -hmm. then when you come from, from that state, it's much easier to start doing certain things. Mm. It's like you said, the brain doesn't recognize what you, um, I don't know how you said that, but the brain doesn't recognize kind of um, what, what hasn't happened yet. So no. if you're thinking about what you want and you're actually living that moment within kind of your meditations or whatever as though it's occurring right here and right now, I don't know the scientific wording for all this, but I know it does something to the neurotransmitters in your brain. Yeah. And this is the environment that we're in. It's just like when we watch a movie, like a lot of people don't realize it, but if you really absorb in the movie, like if there is a hectic scene, your adrenaline in your body goes up. If there's a romantic scene or very sentimental scene, you might start to cry. Now you're so immersed in that movie that you don't realize in the moment where you're really in it, that it's not true. Now, like an actor as well, you know, there's there so many actors, they put themselves in a role, and when you're really engaging in that role, you can feel the emotions mm -hmm. of that person, of that mm -hmm. character, what you do when you project. Whether it's the same thing that you do in your mind, it's just you're so connected to it that you think is the truth. That's why people replay and replay things from their past that happened, that was very painful, or they project it because someone betrayed you because you lost money because this happened in the past mm -hmm. now you see an opportunity but you're already connecting the fear of the loss mm -hmm. and you're feeling it in that moment that's why your heart is beating because yeah. your heart doesn't even know your body is reacting physiologically to the thing as if it was real yeah and that's why is it but you're creating it we're the biggest like because i mean i studied filmmaking i was director mm -hmm. you are the director of your own life yeah. but you don't even realize it mm -hmm. because you're living inside of that movie and that's why it's so important to disconnect. It's what happens with meditation. Because meditation is just creating a distance from your thoughts. And these thoughts are subconscious. This is what, you don't have no control over them. They just pop up like that. Mm. That's why there's so many exercises you can do to basically realize what's happening in your mind when you're thinking. That you're creating images in your brain and your body is reacting to these images as if they were real. I went through a period in my time it a period of time where I trained my mind, and I have to say I've gotten out of it now, but for quite a long time, I trained my mind to um, express as soon as I woke up on a morning. And when we wake up on a morning, when we first open our eyes, we're not fully conscious, it's our mm. subconscious mind, so we're still in theta state. Yeah. Um, but I'd programmed my mind so much that after a while, the first three things that I thought about on a morning was, right, what am I grateful for? So, you know, after a while, um, you know, after doing it for so long, that is that, that was the first thing, first thought that I would think of when I woke up. And um, it's such a great way to start the day mm. because, you know, it's so easy to start the day on thinking negative thoughts, you know, especially when you're in that semi kind of conscious, when you're still in theta yeah. and you're not really un in control of your thoughts. Mm. It's easy to see what, you know, what first comes to your mind, what is the driver for your thoughts. And if it's a negative thought, then you've got like work to do. Yeah. Um, but you can control the mind. So that's, that's well, you can, it's just because most people are not aware train of it. The mind. Yeah, you can train it. Exactly. Mm. Because it's all awareness. Right, so that's, I, I believe that one of the biggest things is a lot of people, they're trying to just learn one technique or one hack, 
when it's just, it's a way of life, you know? It's like when people say, what's the one exercise I can do to get a six pack, you know? But if you don't understand the principles that are beneath it, the exercise is not gonna do anything for you, mm -hmm. right? So you have many people, they meditate, and then right after they get in traffic, and then they start to curse at the person next to them because they're not aware of what's happening in that moment. And that's why it's so important to have that constantly. Like, the mind will wander and we just bring it back. And it will wander and we just bring it back. And that is the biggest training that we can do on ourselves, is just to realize that our reality is created by our focus. Yeah. You just focus on this, and now this is your reality. You focus on that and you see something completely different. And again, it relates a lot to filmmaking because that's also, we can manipulate people to believe anything. If I put my camera on this and I just show you this, now you have a completely different story than if I zoom out and I show you the entire picture. Now you're like, oh, that's why this is happening. But we're doing this in our own minds and we just have like these small, you know, glimpses of reality in our own lives. And now we generalize and create beliefs and judge other people, judge ourselves. And that's why we're the slaves in our own minds. And I don't know who said it. Um, you may be able to enlighten me. But when we realize that our outer world reflects our inner world, then you we'd never think another negative thought again, mm. you know. Um, I, I don't know where yeah, that I heard it before. From. I don't know who, who said that, but it's very true. Okay, let's move on now to exercise, Ben. You love your exercise. You've got an amazing physique. Um, so what really happens to the body when you exercise? And um, do you think that exercise makes us happier? Is there a connection between happiness and exercise? I mean, happiness is, um, you know, is a term that is used a lot. I just believe that, um, you know, there, there are many things that contribute to our happiness, but in general, like, um, our, our just states, right? We have mind, body, and soul, and I believe that everything is important. A lot of people put a lot of emphasis on the one and not on the other. Mm. And when we think about it, it's just like, this is the machine that moves us through this reality, right? A lot of people, they like to think that they're very intellectual and they're all about the mind and, you know, but they neglect that they have a physical body. And that physical body has rules that it lives by. There, you know, you have to sleep, you have to eat. There are certain things that whether you want or not, the body is gonna give you impulses. But certain things you don't see immediately, right? If you're hungry, there's an impulse that comes up. A lot of people, you know, like they only go to the doctor when they're really sick. And as long as they're functioning, they're like, I'm fine. And they learn to accept a level that is below normal, but they accepted it as the new normal. Just because you're not sick doesn't mean that you're healthy, right? And that's, again, to the, th to the symptoms that we, we, we were going at before. You know, instead of not being stressed, because stress is almost like a norm right now, it's like, let's try to reduce stress. But we created stress, right? So where does all that come from? And that's why when you just look at the body and you just look at, okay, just because I'm on 20% and I'm not sick, you know, like, how can I put myself to 100%? Yeah, but sickness, when you say you're not sickness, sickness to me is anything that we get. It's, um, it, it just indicates that we have an imbalance in our body. Um, like I mentioned to you that I'd come out in a tiny little bit of a rash on, on my, my skin. It's not mm. really noticeable, but my first thought was, um, I've put something into my body. So mm. my first thought was, right, I'm going to eliminate dairy. I'll eliminate this out of my diet, drink more water. Yeah. You know, rather than, I certainly wouldn't think, right, I'm going to go to the doctor and get mm. some, I don't know, cream to get rid of that. It's just yeah. like, right, drink more water. So yeah, sickness, I believe, is more of an imbalance, that we've got an imbalance within our body, which is pretty much what you were saying, yeah? Exactly. And it's like, for example, if we look at, you know, like how our body detoxes, you know, because we need to get rid of toxins that are in our body. Well, 70% of all the toxins that, you know, like exit our body mm. go out of our body through exhalation while yeah. we exhale. Most of us, we don't even breathe properly, you know, so we have a lot of breathing exercises. But if you think about it, we were made to live in nature. We were not made to sit down in front of a computer for eight, nine hours, sit in a car, sit on a couch and not move. Now, when you're in nature, automatically you'll start to walk. So now your blood is flowing through your body, through your organs much better. You're going to breathe in, breathe out fresh air. So it's just like a natural state that we were living in when we were in nature. Now you're coming back into this you know, life that we're living in. Now we have to go to a gym and we have to create a superficial environment where we actually replicate what we used to do in nature. Why? Because we're living in a superficial environment. So that's why it's super important because not only it regulates our hormones, you know, when we move our body, 
you have the blood flow, it regulates the, ap the appetite, even your sleep, you're able to sleep and relax better. And so there are so many benefits to working out, but it's actually just bringing you back to a normal state where we're supposed to, because most people are just so disbalanced in their life, but they never realize it until they feel a symptom, which is actually, it's too late, right? It's just like, now you have to counteract that, but why did it even get that far? And that's the problem that like, people always live in reaction and not in creation. So that's why I believe that, yeah, exercising in general and everything is, is, is just about putting you in a state where you're able to perform at your best. And that's why I believe in, you know, like mind, body and soul, that you really have to, you know, push yourself just like challenges in your business or in the projects that you do will force you to grow bigger. You know, even if you're talking about something creative, you take something that challenges you on a creative level, you get more creativity with time. So if you put more weight on your body or more resistance on your body or you're trying to, you know, more, more distance, then you're just going to train your body to perform at a higher level. And then for most people, it's just even to come to a normal level. I'm not even talking about athlete and you got to run a marathon and all that. That is also very good because it just pushes you mentally because you need a routine. You do certain things every single day. And then it just like helps you to create structures and routines in different areas of your body, mm -hmm. whether you feel like it or not. Some days is going to be more sometimes, but you have this resistance for a lot of things that you start in the beginning, especially when you're not good at it. I think the hardest part when it comes to exercise as well is actually getting started. Mm. You know, for people like yourself and yeah. myself that have always been involved in exercise, like for me, I always said running to me is like taking a spoonful of medicine mm. and it always gives me a, a great perspective. If I feel like my head's a bit fuzzy, I go for a run and my yeah. perspective just feels like amazing. I like being outside, definitely. But for those people, I think the people that have got themselves into a bit of a rut, and you know they may be a little bit overweight and exercise is not their default position yeah. you know they're feeling a bit you know a bit crappy and they're not thinking well that's because i need to go for a run or that's because i need to go for a swim um if they're not kind of at that stage yet i mean they're they're the people that to me like when you see them out running when i see someone that you know, looks pretty and fit, or they're quite overweight. And I'm not being disrespectful when I say this, but yeah. I always encourage them. And, you know, and they're the people I think, because it's harder for them. I think it's harder for them to make that first step. But like you were saying then, once you take that first step, and the more you do, it just gets easier and easier and easier until it becomes your default position. Yeah. And I think it just be, it's just as hard because we judge ourselves and we're afraid of judgment. I think that when someone is overweight, it's just a flaw, you know, like that, that is visible, you know? Mm -hmm. If someone, you know, has a different flaw, let's say he's always late or whatever, there's certain things that are not that visible. That's why it's just like it's very easy to peek out from the outside. But every single person that starts with something that they're not good at, that's outside of their comfort zone, it's going to be hard for them once they judge themselves. And then you have these expectations that you put on yourself from the beginning. They're, you know, like not really realistic expectations. So you quit very early on. And that's the thing. You just like a lot of people, they just have these expectations that they put them themselves. So mm -hmm. there are many elements that we can use to actually make it easier for ourselves. Yeah. This is a really good segue actually into my next question. Because my next question is all about overcoming fear and mm -hmm. stepping outside your comfort zone. Um, so. What do you think about the concept that life begins at the end of your comfort zone? And do you have a story that you can share with the audience about how you challenged your fears? Every single day. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I really believe that, you see, when we say life begins at the end of our comfort zones, right? A lot of people, like we just said, uh, we create distress states when, when we're afraid of something. Um, that we envision, right? They say that a coward dies a thousand deaths and a courageous man only dies once because you're, you're actually really going in there. And most of the times, it's not death that is awaiting us. It is growth, you know, and, and we're judging ourselves too much. So, um, I mean, there are so many situations where I had to put myself out of my comfort zone and actually, you know, go on stage for the first time or, you know, just put myself out there for the first time or any, any, any entrepreneur, like the day that they say, okay, I want to do this and I want to start. And your heart starts to beat very fast, which means you're alive. So mm -hmm. that is actually where life starts. You know, a lot of people, I, I honestly, um, if, if you're constantly in a stress state, then it's not good. 
I mean, lifting heavy weight or pushing your, your body to a limit is a stressed state. But when you do it for a certain period of time and then you recover, that's when you grow. If you go out and you work out five hours a day without recovery, that's when you actually damage your body. So when you put yourself in regular intervals at the edge of your comfort zone and you do something where, you know, if, if, you, if you choose a goal and you're like, I know I can do that, it's probably too small. Now when you pick something when you're like, you know what, I might fail at that, but I'm gonna go for it. Now all of a sudden you're alert. Now your adrenaline goes up. Now you feel alive. And I actually go for that. I used to want to evade that feeling. Just like, ah, once it feels like that, let me go a little bit, little bit back. Let me wait a little bit. I'm not ready yet. And people always said, I'm not ready yet. They're waiting for that feeling to go away. Maybe if I prepare more, maybe if I talk to more people, maybe if I read more, maybe if I learn this one new technique, maybe if I find out what happened in my childhood and this one limitation is gone, then this emotion is going to be gone because, and that is, you know, like the, the, the belief that a lot of people have and what's, why it's so important to surround yourself with people that are where you want to be. Because we have beliefs about people that are there. Before I went on stage for the first time, I saw people that were on stage talking comfortably and, you know, with a lot of confidence. And I thought, they're not nervous. They're not feeling, you know, any resistance. They just go on stage, just doing it like this. They just talk in front of the camera. They can't do all these things. But I feel this fear, so I'm not ready yet. But then you surround yourself with these people. First of all, they tell you how they felt the first time they go in. You have people that have been doing it for 10 times and say, I still get nervous. And what does nervous mean? At the end of the day, it's an emotion that comes up. And when I heard this for the first time, it was just like an eye opener because it was like, how can you differentiate fear from excitement in your body? Like if now you just got a text message, you won the lottery, $10 million, and you got to go pick up that check and it's going to change your entire life. You just go there and you'll be like, oh my God, you're going to start shaking. Your heart is going to beat. You're going to be super excited. Now close your eyes and remember how it felt like to be afraid to do that one thing you wanted to do and tell me the difference between the way it feels in your body. You it feels, can't. It feels the same. It feels the same. So how do you know this is fear and not excitement? You mm. don't. So embrace it and do it anyways. And that's something that I've just been doing constantly. Ben, you, you wrote a fantastic poem called <laughs> I Am Possible. Yeah. Have we got time today? We do. What time is it, Carl? It's 7.30. Uh, 5.30. So it's 5.30. Well, I got a power call at what time? At 6. At 6? Yeah. All right. We got time. That's okay, good. Okay. Cool. All right. Go yeah, on. well, and that was take, actually... Take it away. So, and, and before I say that, actually, I want to come back to the one thing because yeah. you said that um, to, to, to really go for something... Um, like I said, because there is one bridge between you know me being a filmmaker and me doing what I do right now. Um, because, like I said, I started like 15 years ago to really you know with self development and you know like for myself because I needed it for myself. Mm. And I realized that I was so passionate about this. I was really almost obsessed to learn more about psychology, about how I can really change. Because you have these limitations that you have in your own business, in your own life, and you learn that you can overcome them. It becomes like a game, but you still want to learn more and experience. And I actually started to develop my own tools for myself. And I, I recorded a video. It was a project, a video project, like around seven years ago, like right at the time when I came to Dubai. It was a project in Germany where we had to do like a portrait of like 10 um, young people that are living in Germany with migration background. So they're German, but they're from maybe Turkey or Iran or African and half German. Um, but they are not shown in the media. They're not really represented in the media. You usually see people that are not integrated, people that are criminal or whatever. You don't really see a Turkish doctor or a black lawyer or whatever, right? So we're supposed to do these, 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 um, these portraits and the woman in charge told me, do nine portraits of these people and do one of yourself. And I was first, I was like, okay, you know, do a, port a video portrait, right? So it's just like a around 20 minute video. So I did it and a lot of what I was thinking, my whole mindset flew into that video. A friend of mine saw it and I said, you have to upload it to YouTube. I said, okay, seven, eight years ago again. So YouTube wasn't what it is now. So I didn't think much of it. So I just uploaded it. I didn't have no expectations. I didn't. I thought maybe a couple hundred people will see it that you know that I sent the link to, and so I just uploaded it to YouTube. Forgot about it. I didn't have a website. I didn't have a Facebook fan page. None of that. Like all influencers, all these things that was like didn't even exist. Two years passed by, 
Now, all of a sudden, a couple of people started to share the video, posted it on Facebook, and you know, one famous singer in Germany reposted the video, and now all of a sudden, within one week, I'm receiving like so many friend, uh, Facebook friend requests. Like I reached like 5,000, I can't take more people, and people are messaging me, wow, your video is amazing, it changed my life, I've been watching it every single day. Every single day I received emails, I received messages. People like, write a book, um, where do you have more videos, do you have a podcast, this, that, and, and, and I was just like, overwhelmed a little bit I was like okay you know like I mean like I have my company I'm doing this film mm -hmm. production thing and you know this is just my passion because I was reading books studying doing all this on the side on the weekends and just for myself and then I was just like started to play with the idea and then you know a lot of influencers from Germany started to contact me because they had a podcast and a YouTube channel they want to interview me and you know like so another year passed by and I started to see you know so many influencers and I was just like this is actually what I want to do and on top of it, it's my calling. Because this thing has, has been calling me. People wow. are messaging me every single day. Mm -hmm. And I was just like not embracing it because somehow in my mind, I had a different idea of what I wanted to do. I didn't do. realize actually the story behind this poem and how it seems that this poem has actually been the springboard to you doing what yes. you're doing now. And that's so interesting because there's so many people out there like content producers who've got amazing content like you mm. that maybe they don't want to upload and it can actually stay like undiscovered for yeah. a while but all it takes one is video. one person to share it yeah like maybe you know someone who's got a lot of followers on Facebook on Instagram or whatever to share that and yeah. then that's it and the opportunities that that can bring you in terms of kind of being a motivational speaker in terms of maybe getting a book deal or or whatever and so. that's what's crazy because again I didn't plan to do it you know mm. and that sometimes it's like when you beauty. plan something I just did it because that's what came from and inside. it came from your heart exactly yeah. and, it, and it took I mean one video it, it in total it has almost like five million views Wow, five and, million. you know on, you know on YouTube and Facebook yeah. if you count them all together uh -huh. and and that was one thing where I was just like okay if one video can do that What's going to happen if I start really uploading a lot? And, and then it's just like exactly that thing, going outside of your comfort zone, really starting it. Because doing one video, especially if you only do one video and it gets so many views, now doing the second one, now you start having expectations. Now you start thinking like, oh, what if I do the second one? It's not as good as the first one. Now I got to top this, you know? Now everyone is looking at me. It's like, to them, I'm like the motivational speaker. And this and I was just like, wow, they have all these expectations. So then... I wrote this poem, I Am Possible, within like, I don't know, like an hour or two. I just wrote it down like that. It was literally just there. And it's the first time that I wrote something in English, because before I only wrote everything in German. And basically, after I wrote that poem, I decided, you know what, I'm closing down my company. I'm starting with this. I'm not trying to start this on the side and go slow, because I knew you either go all in or you don't do it at all. Mm -hmm. And you need that environment. So then I really implemented everything that I know and I started this and I launched it and you know now this is what I do. I'm one of the number one mindset coaches in Germany when it comes to this and I build up my company in two years and you just really because there's something that it's not something new. I've been doing it for fifteen years. I've been ready for so long. It's just like now I'm actually just putting it out there. Mm -hmm. Right? So I wrote this poem, I am possible. And it goes like this. Sometimes I slip and fall. I have to dig and crawl and feel so frustrated that I slam my fist on walls. I spent years in the shadow, doubted myself. And no one came to my rescue when I shouted for help. And I always knew what to do, but I didn't do what I knew. Today I win or I win because I got nothing to lose. Pay your dues and you reap the benefits. Winners are not those who never fail, but those who never quit. Don't compare yourself. It might scare yourself. It's an obstacle. Only use others' greatness as a proof that it's possible. Competing with nobody but the man in the mirror. Because only, only when you achieve to surpass yourself, you're a winner. Your talents and ideas are a gift from God. And throwing away that gift is like dissing God. No, I don't disregard the fact that this is hard. That's why I start my day with my toughest challenge. I eat that frog. Open books <laughs> lay next to my bed on my shelf. Because like a Polaroid picture, I develop myself. I was a realist. But who decides what real is? Like definitions of words. Who decides what fear is? What could F-E-A-R mean? Let me try. 
forget everything and run off, face everything and rise. Ignite that fire in your heart and just keep it burning. New definition of fail, first attempt in learning. It's a choice to say no or scream loud, yeah! Opportunity is nowhere or now, here. Impossible or I am possible. If you want to grow, mind that comfort zone. It seems so far away. You need more time, you wait, but know that you assassinate your dreams when you procrastinate. The richest place in the world is the cemetery. People now dead and buried that could have been legendary. Dreams never lived, ideas never shared, never created, innovated, out of fear, never dared. As long as you learn from your errors, it is not a mistake. You don't have to be great to start, but have to start to be great. So start today and say, I will not delay. And every obstacle in my way will be knocked away. Put your hand on your chest, feel your heart beating and say, I'm scared, I wanna run, but I'm not leaving. I might fall and get hurt, but will not stop dreaming. Cause I know eventually every wound stops bleeding until I stop breathing, I will not stop to grow. And always remember that I am possible. Until I stop breathing, I will not stop to grow. And always remember that I am possible. I love it. Thank you. I love <laughs> that you. poem. It's fantastic. I love the uh, Brian Tracy. Eat oh, that yeah, frog yeah. Eat that well. frog, yeah. yeah. I used to eat that frog every morning when there. I worked in financial services. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I used to eat that frog by picking up the phone because it was the, word, the only thing that I didn't want to do. Mm. So if any of you don't know, eat that frog means do, doing something that you don't like doing first thing. That thing that you're going to put off all day, get it done right at the start of the day. Yeah, it's basically so. said, because uh, that's also when I heard from Brian Tracy, he's like, if, everything, if every day you had to eat a live frog, that would probably be the worst thing you would do that day and everything else would feel like easy after that. So yeah. eat that frog. Oh, thank you so much. Oh my God, we've been thank going you. for over an hour. I did have another question, but you know what? <laughs> I think on that note, Ben, I'd just like to thank you so much for being such a fantastic guest me. today. Um, I'm sure everyone will agree that we've got some you know, real gold from Ben today. And guys, um, if you enjoyed this podcast, please like and please share. Thank you again, Ben. And thank you so much to Rope Hotel in Dubai Marina for allowing us to use this amazing venue to host all the podcasts. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. And if you want to know more about me, check out my Facebook. Or maybe you can link you know, some of my links down there. Definitely. And, uh, I yeah. will do that. So I'll link Ben's Facebook and Instagram. Amazing. And thank you so you. much, Zoe. Thank you.